Good evening, uh, CHBC, and welcome to you. And and also a special welcome for any uh, who are tuning in who are not from the church. It's uh, wonderful that you can join in and uh, be part of this. And I hope it's a real blessing for you. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know me, uh, my name is Nathan, and I am one of the pastors here. Uh, so again, it's uh, it's uh, it's wonderful that uh, you can all be tuning in to hear God's uh, word. Just a just an announcement uh, regarding next week. Uh, we are going to be again having a Q and A uh, in the evening service for next week. So this coming week, uh, as of tonight, if you've got any theological questions, any burning uh, questions, please. Uh, send one of the pastors a text message, uh, send us an email. If you go into the church website, you'll have uh, the office email. Uh, but send your, send your questions in so that we can uh, look at them next Sunday night. I know there was a few of you wanting uh, to do that last Q&A, but you'd have forgotten and didn't get the questions in on time. So uh, keep that in mind and send off your questions. Uh, well, tonight I want to uh, talk about the greatest date that still remains on God's calendar. I want to talk about the most terrible day that is coming. Uh, I want to talk about the most wonderful day that is coming. Uh, But in order to do that, let's look at the text tonight to see this. So if you have your Bibles, please open up and have a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll look at verses 1 to 11. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 11. And it reads, Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. That's the Lord's word. He who has ears, let him hear. The word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask for his help. Our Father, we come before you tonight and we come uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We tune in and uh, we are only a church because of the Lord Jesus. Father, what an important, what a profound, what a glorious passage, what a weighty passage we have before us tonight. I pray that you would be so gracious to us. Help me, Lord, to even explain this in a clear manner. Help me to be gripped by it and to be constrained by it. And I pray that each person tuning in and listening, God, that they would receive your word with all willingness, no matter how it feels as it comes uh, it comes to us, Lord, no matter how, how it hurts or whether it comforts and what, whatever it does, help us to receive it. Help us to hear from you tonight. This passage is all about the Lord. It's about what's coming. So please help us to hear, help us to see, get a glimpse of Christ. Help us to respond, each one of us, wherever we're at, to respond in the way that is pleasing to you. I pray for your help. We pray for the sending and work of the Holy Spirit, even even in this moment. And we commit ourselves to you and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this As we look at this passage here, just these 11 verses, the subject of the whole passage is the day of the Lord. You see that in verse 2. Now, what is the day of the Lord? 
Now, this is not a, a teaching that just pops up and first appears in the New Testament. It is frequently repeated, this phrase, in the Old Testament. Now, based upon these Old Testament statements and teaching teachings, the Jews understood uh, that there were two ages uh, for the history of the world. There are two ages. The, there is firstly the present age. That is the age that we live in. That is this age of darkness, of sin, of misery, of punishment, of suffering, of evil and wickedness. The present age. But they understood that there was also another age. That is, the second one is the age to come. This refers to the golden era, the new era coming. This is the reestablishment of Eden, as it were, uh, an, an age of peace and righteousness where there's no more bloodshed, pure joy and righteousness. Now, when would this age to come finally arrive? Well, a day and an event would first occur. There would be a day that ends the current age, the present age, and the day brings in the new age, the age to come. There is an event that happens that stops the old and brings in the new, and that is the day of the Lord. Now, the New Testament reveals to us that the day of the Lord, this event, is the second coming of Jesus Christ, his return. So Jesus' return involves the destroying of the present and the recreating, the the, the making of the new age, of the new world, the creation of the new. And so that's why the day of the Lord is portrayed as both horrifying and wonderful because it is a day of destruction while simultaneously being a day of rescue. It's a day of judgment, of blessing, of fear and rejoicing. So it will be a day of terror for unbelievers, but it would be a day where uh, uh, for unbelievers and it will be a day for believers where their hope is finally fulfilled. Terror for unbelievers, hope fulfilled for believers. Now, our passage, this one section, shows us the two experiences of of believers and unbelievers uh, regarding the second coming, the day of the Lord. So firstly, I want you to see our first point tonight is the terror of the second coming for unbelievers. And this is seen in verses 1 to 3. Now, one of the scariest aspects of the second coming for unbelievers is the unexpected and surprising nature of the day of the Lord, of his return. Look at the unexpected and surprising nature of it, verses 1 and 2. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So this is, this is how it's described here. The first metaphor, the first word picture to describe the day of the Lord, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. Now this is how Jesus himself described his second coming when he was here during his first coming. He said it would be like this. Luke chapter 12 verse 39. But understand this. This is his parable. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming... He would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus is coming back like a thief in the night. The point of the metaphor is that he's going to come at an unexpected time. The thing about robbers is that they, that they come at an unexpected time. They do not announce their visit. They don't send you a friendly text the night before. And so really, this is a threat and a warning from God as he says, this is what's going to happen. And also notice how futile is trying uh, is the attempt to try and predict dates and times of his arrival. Look at verse 1. About times and dates, we don't need to write to you, for you know it will be like a thief in the night. The disciples asked Jesus, when will it happen? What will the time, what will the date be? People Preachers and churchgoers do this all the time, trying to figure out the date of it. Why do people want to seek out and find out the date and the time of Jesus' return? Well, there are a number of reasons. 
But one of the key reasons why non-Christians and severely backsliding Christians want to know the date is because they want to be able to circle a date on their calendar when Jesus is coming back. They want to know when they need to take things seriously. They want to know how long they can go in their sin and in their pursuit of living for self before they have to quickly be prepared. There is absolutely no commitment nor desire to heed what Jesus commanded. You must deny yourselves, take up your cross daily and follow me. They do not want that. They want to know a date so that they can live conveniently for them. They want the date so that they can live a double life Christianity. Now, I have to ask you the question, do you want to know the time and date of Jesus' coming? Are you so bound in sin, so much entangled in this life? Are you so given to the things of this world that you want to know the time and date of his return because you don't live for that day? Answer that question. God is listening. Is that you? Answer the question. To the unsaved and to those who are fake in their Christianity, he will come, it says, like a thief in the night. This great event that happens, some people will be at work. Some people will be asleep. Some people will be at the shop. Some people will be at church. Some people will be walking. Some people will be driving. Some people will be playing. Some people will be getting drunk. Some people will be committing a crime. Some people will be in the very act of adultery. Some people will be uh, sitting on the couch. Others will be on a hot holiday but all of a sudden whatever the situation is there will be the sound of a booming trumpet a trumpet blast this will be the greatest surprise attack in the history of the world the greatest surprise history will stop life will stop everything everything will be halted every eye will see his blazing glory in the clouds like fire in appearance will be the visible sign of the Son of Man in the clouds. Like fire and lightning. See, for many countries, when Jesus comes back, it'll be daytime and they'll see him in the clouds. For other countries, it'll be in the middle of the night and yet they will be woken up and they will still see him blazing in glory in the clouds. Every, in this moment, every single eye, every head will be looking upward. Every mouth will be silenced and every knee will bow. From the Muslim to the communist leader to the Pope from, and to the atheist and the skeptic. To rich and poor alike, all eyes will be looking unto him. And to those who are lost and not saved, Jesus will come back like a thief, like a foreign intruder. Foreign because he is not of this world and they don't know him. As an intruder because they don't want him here. And it's bad news. What will be the attitude of people leading up to the moment of Jesus' return? What will life be like just before he gets back? Look at verse 3. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. While people are saying peace and safety, who's going to be saying peace and safety when Jesus is about to come back? Who is going to be doing that? Well, there's going to be two groups who are going to be proclaiming peace and safety. The first group is the world and false religions. Jesus said what the world will be doing, uh, and he said this in Luke chapter 17. He predicted this, foretold this. He said, life will be going on like normal. People will be eating, they'll be drinking, and they'll be given in marriage. It'll be just like the days of Lot and Noah. But in both situations, judgment came down unexpectedly because life was just normal at the time. Eating, drinking, getting married. Who's the second group that will be saying peace and security? Well, false teachers 
and false churches. Those who win numbers and draw in the crowds to their churches by diluting and distorting the message. They have a prosperity gospel. They have a a promotion teaching. They teach about promotion and healing. They promise the people every year this will be your best and most successful year. They preach peace and security and they never, never, ever, ever, ever mention the coming judgment you'll never hear them preach the word hell they'll never talk about a day of vengeance and anger from the lord god that is coming they will not this is what those churches are like there's one up the road mega one As the world and false churches live like this, it says destruction will come on them suddenly. As they preach and and speak peace and security, it will come on them suddenly. Destruction. Look at the second metaphor, the word picture that he uses there. So there was a thief, like a thief in the night. Look at the second half of verse 3. It will come on them suddenly. Destruction as labor pains on a pregnant woman. Suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. From no pain to immediate agony in a second. What does this metaphor show us? What's the point of it? That this event, this moment, this terror, it is inevitable and it is unavoidable. If a woman is pregnant, labor pains are unavoidable. It is inevitable. In the same way, Jesus' return in terror, bringing terror and destruction is inevitable and unavoidable. It must come and it will come. And notice the end of verse 3. And they will not escape. If you are not forgiven and found in Christ, you will be lost. You will be destroyed. You will face destruction and you will not escape. The imagery here is like that of the event of 9-11. That awful event with the Twin Towers. When that plane hit the building, those who were caught at the top of the building, they were either crushed to death or they were consumed by the fire. There was no escape Understand, lost person tonight, just as those planes came for the tower, Jesus Christ is coming back for you to come against you, to attack you. He's coming for you. And destruction will come upon you suddenly. And it says you will not escape. This is what the day of the Lord will be like for those who are not saved. The second coming. Listen to... What the day, how the day of the Lord is described in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. Listen to these words. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. Understand, he's coming back to destroy this earth, but he's also coming back to destroy all those sinners in it. I have to ask you the question and press the question. Do you belong to Jesus? Are your sins forgiven and covered by him? Otherwise, destruction is coming for you. To the Christian, I hope these words have sobered you. I hope they have awoken you. I hope even now, if this is the case, that you are hopefully saying now, Nathan, I want to live for that day. I want to live for Jesus Christ. I want to be serious about this. I want to be prepared for the day of his return. I want that. But Nathan, how? How do I prepare? How do I, how do I live? How do I be ready for it? Well, Paul tells us, Paul tells us, and this is our next point, in verses 8, he shows us the Christian's preparation for the second coming. The Christian's preparation for the second coming. We've seen we don't prepare by trying to guess the date or the time. But notice the shift from unbelievers experiencing the second coming to the believers' experience of the second coming. Look at verse 4. But you, brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Did you see the difference there between the Christian and the non-Christian? It says, brothers and sisters, Christians, this day will not surprise you like a thief in the night. It won't be a surprising 
terrible day for you. The shock and surprise won't be the same for Christians. Why not? Look what he says at the beginning of of verse 4. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness so as to be surprised like a thief by a thief in the night. See, the difference is because of who we are now. Look at that difference. Look at verse 5. Look at the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. Verse 5, you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Christians are sons of the light, it says. We are sons of the day. Non-Christians are sons of the darkness, sons of the night. What does it mean to be a son of the light, a son of the day? It means to know the truth. It means to walk in righteousness, in holiness. It means to have fellowship and relationship with God. It means to have peace with Him. We as Christians are not in darkness. What does it mean we're not in darkness like unbelievers? Well, even that saying, we use it today. To be in the dark about something is to be ignorant about something. If you're left in the dark about something, it means you don't know what's going on. But also, darkness and, ro- and, and night, it's symbolic of lostness. It's symbolic of being bound and caught and entangled in sin. Uh, darkness and night is, is symbolism of sensuality. Think about it. If you say, she is a woman of the night, it's referring to prostitution. Darkness and night refer to the unconverted, their sinful lives. See, to be of the group who are in darkness and of the night, one, it means to be ignorant of the truth. You're in the dark. You're ignorant of what's coming. But it also means to be caught up and plunged into sin. It's this twofold meaning. Look how this twofold description of darkness is portrayed in verses 6 and 7. Look at this. Verses 6 and 7. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. Go to verse 7. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. So this twofold character, uh, what characterizes those in darkness is sleep, which is mentioned in verse 6 and 7, and drunkenness. Now, let's look at these two metaphors, sleep and drunkenness. They're word pictures here. They're symbolic. Sleep is a, is a picture and a reference to how the unbeliever is ignorant of the truth. They have this misplaced ease. They're unalert. They're not ready. They're lazy and they're carefree. They are passive about being right with Jesus. When you talk to someone and they say, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll consider Jesus later on, not, not just now. Or they say, yeah, 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 I'll come back to church and start doing all that when I have kids and when I settle down. This is a picture of misplaced ease. See, the imagery here is imagine an apartment building on fire and there's people screaming and they're running out of the fire exits. But you look in one window of that apartment and you see a man, the television's on and he is fast asleep with a blanket on, cozy on the lounge. He thinks everything is fine while the place is burning down. He is in a spiritual coma. People who are lost are in a spiritual coma. They're in darkness. There's no movement. There's nothing. They are not any closer to God than the day before. The second metaphor of darkness and those who are people of the night is drunkenness. Now, drunkenness commonly happens at night. If sleep... If those who sleep refers to those who are passive and ignorant, drunkenness refers to those who actively pursue sin. Those who are actively, it's symbolic of the pursuit and indulgence of sin. It is self-indulgence. It is pleasure-seeking. It is love of entertainment. It is drowning out reality with pleasure. This is people who can play video games all night, watch TV all night, watch YouTube all night, while the sand in their hourglass is running out. They're indulging in sin. And this is the great tragedy of those who are of the night and darkness. They are asleep towards God, but they are awake to living for sin. But that's not who the true Christian is. Paul says, we 
are sons of the day. We are sons of the light. So, if the Christian is radically different from the unbeliever, if we are sons of the light, how should a Christian then live in light of the second coming? How should we live in in light of the imminence of Jesus' return? If unbelievers are characterized by sleep and drunkenness, then believers should be characterized by the very opposite. Well, what's the opposite? Paul tells us the opposite to sleep and drunkenness at the end of verse 6. But let us be alert and self-controlled. Literally in the Greek, be awake and sober. The very opposite of asleep and drunk. This is these instructions we get to now. This is the how to in preparing for Jesus' return. Here it is the how to to be prepared for Jesus' return. Firstly, he says, be alert. Be alert. This means the word means be awake, be vigilant, be watchful. This is the opposite of drowsiness, indifference, apathy, and carelessness. Jesus taught us when he spoke about his return. He said, keep watch, stay awake, be alert. And Paul is moved by the Holy Spirit and he says the same thing. Keep watch, be alert. This is living mindful of his return. What does this look like practically? You make life decisions based upon the reality of Jesus' return. You don't settle, invest, and, and, and put your roots deep into this world. We are passing through this life. This world isn't your priority. And therefore, because he's coming back, because you're mindful and alert of that, you, you display patience through suffering, through hardships, through disappointment, through persecution, patience through sickness. Because you're mindful he's coming back. This looks like being ready at all times. You're not caught off guard. This means that you don't waste time because time could be very short. And so you invest in the body of Christ. You spend time with other Christians to build them up and see them grow. And if you're alert and watchful for his return, it places a new urgency upon evangelism. Time is running out and sinners will be wiped out. There's urgency to share your faith. This is being alert and awake. But the second thing he describes here, the second application, be alert. Secondly, be self-controlled. And notice he says this twice in verse 6 and at the beginning of verse 8. Since we belong to the day, again, let us be self-controlled. This is twice he repeats self-control. This is to live sober, to live clear-minded. This is to be restrained in your living. Living restrained. This is not living for the latest and the greatest or the newest and the best. It's not about that. It's simplistic living. It's living a life of self-denial. It's not abusing good things like food, fun, recreation, good things that God gives us. Not abusing that. This self-control refers to restraint and self-discipline. Understand, Christian, deep within us, there are so many sinful passions that are within us longing, longing to be gratified. Do not feed them. They are like weeds. They don't need much sunlight. They don't need much water to grow. Starve them, choke them out, and suffocate them. This is a life of self-restraint. And the two go hand in hand. You must live alert, watchful, and awake, vigilant. And you must live self-controlled and restrained. Know this, if you live alert and yet not, self-control, not with self-control, it's pointless. It's pointless. You know people as well as I do. Those churchgoers, they know everything about the second coming. They can talk about it inside out, back to front, top to bottom. They can tell you every view, every clue, every sign. They can tell you everything about the second coming. But when you look at their life, there is not a shred of evidence evidence of a holy life that is the fruit of self-controlled and restrained living. 
There is no self-control, no simplicity, no restraint. Friend, if that's you, your knowledge, your being watchful and keeping awake, awake, it's absolutely useless. And it will not benefit you one bit. Let me quote Alexander McLaren. He writes this, quote, You cannot look upwards and downwards at the same moment. Your heart is only a tiny room after all. And if you cram it full of the world, you relegate your master to the stable outside. You cannot serve God and money. End quote. Christian, are you indulging in entertainment, in pleasure, in the pursuits of this world? Are you being carried away by the things that sparkle and entertain you in this life? Are you doing that? Are you being led astray by this world? Answer the question because Jesus is listening. Answer the question. Your Lord listens in this moment. Well, Paul has a little more application for us Christians to prepare for the second coming. Look at verse 8. It's a wonderful application. But since... Verse 8, but since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. He says, darkness is strong. The world is strong. The allurements of this life are so strong. You need to armor up. You need to get your armor on. Look at this metaphor picture that he gives. He gives two, two, um, two pieces of armor. Uh, for warfare. The first one is a breastplate of faith and love, and the second one is a helmet that is the hope of salvation. Now, here, Paul, uh, in a condensed version of, of, of the armor of God, uh, Paul call, um, puts emphasis on the, that famous triad, uh, the three Christian virtues that he constantly references faith, hope, and love. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 13 13? And these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. Look at the first bit of armory that he tells us. The breastplate. This is the modern equivalent to a bulletproof vest. It protects the vital organs. What will protect your, your vital organs from the bullets of temptation? What will protect you? He says, faith and love. Suit up in faith and love. You see, faith Faith, firstly, is trusting in God, trusting in God despite the circumstances. It's easy to trust God when things are easy. But why? Why is it that we suffer so much from worry and anxiety and distress and fear? Why? Because we stop trusting God. Our faith in Him diminishes. We take off the, fa- uh, the breastplate of faith. We take it off. We fear the bullets more than we trust in God. Put on the breastplate of faith. And he says, and and the breastplate, he says, is also made from love. Love. Love for God. Love for Jesus. Put on that love. What could be better defense against temptation and allurements than love for Jesus? Think about this. If your love for Jesus is burning stronger than a love for pornography or worldliness, whatever it is, you can overcome. When your love for Christ outweighs and overshadows love for everything else, then you can overcome temptation because you long for and delight in something more than those things. So how do you put on the breastplate of faith and love? Or, Christian, how do you reattach it if it's come off? How do you put it back on? It is only through the regular reading of God's word, the careful study of God's word, and the careful application and implementing of his word in your life. You read of his person, you read of his gospel, you read of his promises, you read of his plan, you read of his incredible character, and you watch faith begin to arise in you. 
Read of his kindness. Read of his pity. Read read of his mercy towards sinners. Read of his unflinching and undeserving love for you. And you watch love for Christ well up within you. The love of Christ will constrain you, as Paul said. And Paul adds, also, don't forget your helmet. Don't forget your helmet. As a helmet, the hope of salvation. The hope of salvation. This is the future aspect of salvation. You have kind of two parts here. The moment a person turns to Christ in faith, when they put their trust in Him for the forgiveness of sins, they are saved before God. They are rescued They are rescued from and spared the punishment for sin. They are now right in God's sight. But there is still a future aspect of salvation that we don't enjoy yet, that we haven't received yet. That is to be rid of this sinful body. That is to be with Him. That, that is to be delivered from the future wrath to come when He returns. This, is, this occurs when He returns. Look at the two stages of this salvation. Look at it in verses 9 and 10. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. What is he showing us here? We were running a sprint directly towards the wrath and judgment of God. Our compasses were pointed to hell. The decisions of our life all led to that one destination. And the wages for all of our life's labors had one destination, the wrath of God in hell forever. But God, but God, this world is heading for wrath. But God, it says in verse 9, He did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Christian, God had other plans for you despite your running. He had other plans. What were those other plans? Verse 9. But he appointed you to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the future salvation. Being spared the wrath to come on the day of the Lord when the the Lord comes back in fury to destroy everything. It's spared. It's rescued from that. How How does he do this? How does he spare us from the wrath that we deserve? How does he do it? Well, verse 10 tells us. Verse 10. He died for us. How does Jesus' death save us? Listen, someone dying for you is of no benefit to you. The death of another person for you doesn't benefit you. The death of a Jewish man 2,000 years ago was no benefit to people then and is no benefit to people of the 21st century. Unless... Unless his death was as a payment for sin. Unless he died in the place of sinners. Unless he was dying as a substitutionary figure. Unless his death involved payment for sin and absorbing the wrath of God on behalf of people. Then it's of great benefit. What is the This helmet, this hope of salvation, what is it? Verse 10, he died for us so that, here's the hope, whether we are awake or whether asleep, whether we're living when he returns or whether we're dead, that we may live together with him. Do you see? He loved us and he died for us even when we didn't love him. He loved us even to the point of death, the giving up of his own life for us. But what is the final hope of so great a salvation as this? What is the hope of salvation? It says it there, that we may live together with him. This is the hope to come. This is to enjoy him forever and for him to enjoy us forever. To be with him. Paul says, there's your helmet. Put it on. 
put it on this great hope that we're going. He's coming back for us to take us to be with him. He's bringing us back to a far greater Eden. Do you understand how much it cost him to bring you back so that you might be with him again? Paul says, there's your helmet. Put it on. Hope of salvation. See, this is why we have the word of God. This is why I'm preaching. You see, you don't want this world. You don't want what this world has to offer when you've got your armor on and you're looking upwards. You don't want this. You don't want it. Paul says, put the armor on. Look up. Let me close with a final point. I'll only be five minutes on it. The final point here. And this is the responsibility of the local church in light of the second coming. The responsibility of the local church. Look at verse 11 with me. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. You see that? Therefore, Paul's saying it's response time. It's response time. And he says, encourage one another firstly. This is to support, exhort Push each other on about things to come, about what's ahead of us. Help each other out. And the second second thing he says there, he says, encourage one another, build each other up. That word means to strengthen, to repair, to establish. Help each other out to make sure you're ready for the Lord's return. Understand, this prescription, this instruction here is not just referring and is not just given to pastors and leaders of the church. No, it's given to all of us to be contacting each other, to be close to one another, to spend time with one another, to speak about these things, to redirect each other's gazes upwards. And do you see that, that little there, how, how Paul gives them praise? Look, he tucks it away at the verse 11, verse 11 at the end. Praise that he gives them. He says, just as in fact you are doing. They were encouraging each other. They were building each other up and strengthening one another. Paul gives credit to them where credit is due. They have been doing this. But again, I have, to, I have to ask this question. If Paul was writing to CHBC, if he was writing this letter to us, could he commend us about these things like he commends the Thessalonians? Would he commend us regarding this, about encouraging each other, strengthening each other to be ready for the second coming? You know, when, when you read back in Genesis... After Cain had killed his brother Abel, God spoke to Cain and God said this, Cain, where is your brother Abel? And Cain replied to God, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Christian, you are the keeper of your brothers and sisters here. You are your brothers and sisters keeper. It is not the growth and protection and help and encouragement of the people of God does not rest solely on the pastors, elders and leaders. It does not. It's on all of us to be encouraging each other, supporting, strengthening each other, helping each other out, helping us to look forward and not around. God requires this of us. God says to us, where is your brother? Where is your sister? Are they okay? Christian, you are your brother's and sister's keeper in these things. The health and growth of the church is dependent upon the church encouraging and building each other up in light of the Lord's return. You see, we must all strengthen and exhort each other. We must strengthen the weak. We must exhort those who are straying. We must encourage the faithful and we must comfort the hurting with these precious truths. We must redirect. We must remind each other to be alert, to be self-controlled. And we must remind each other to put on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of coming salvation as a helmet. We must do this. The most terrible day is coming. The most wonderful day is coming. 
And Jesus says to every single person listening and to every single person not listening, he says, ready or not, here I come. Father, we come before you. And Lord, as we contemplate the day of the Lord, the coming back of your Son, Oh God, these are not things, these are not things to take lightly. These are such serious, such important truths. Oh God, I pray for those whose sins are not covered in the blood of Christ, who do not belong to the day and to the light, who are not walking with Christ. I pray they would take refuge in Him now, that they would see that the smoke alarms are going off, that the fire is already starting to burn and destruction is on its way any moment. I pray, oh God, that they would take refuge in Christ by putting faith in Him. Take shelter. Bunker down in Christ, please. May you do this by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray for all the Christians, Lord, who are listening, those who are struggling, those who are being caught up in worldliness. God, may you sober them with this truth of Christ's return. I pray that you would deliver them from these temptations. Help them to be self-controlled, to be alert. Help them to put on the armor of God. I pray as even as a local church that we would love one another, that we would care for one another, that we would see that we are each other's our brothers and sisters' keepers. Oh, that we would be helping each other get to glory and to be found faithful at the return of Christ. Help us, O oh God, I pray. Help us, we ask, so that Jesus may be glorified when he comes back. I pray this and I ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. May the Lord bless you and may he bless the preaching and reading of his word to each person listening. Amen.